intermittent fasting as you are trying to become super fertile and nourish your body for conceiving for me is counterintuitive because it's a stressor welcome to get pregnant naturally where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, and my mission is to inspire, motivate, and empower you. Most of all, I want you to wake up. So with functional medicine, we can discover what causes infertility and eventually reverse the condition. Today, I'm welcoming Vivica Menegas to the podcast, and we're digging into whether the ketogenic diet can boost fertility. Vivica is a certified whole food nutritionist, health blogger, published author, a prominent thought leader in ketogenic and paleolithic diet and lifestyle practices, as well as one of the world's leading voices for a food-based approach to healing. She is the founder of the Healing Foods Method, a 14-week online nutrition program where she works one-on-one with clients to achieve breakthrough results in their health by using a therapeutic ketogenic diet for healing, keto paleo. Tracing back to her Italian origins, Vivica is a passionate cook with ketogenic, paleolithic, and carnivore-based recipes and nutrition advice have been shared with millions through her blog, The Nourished Caveman. She's also the host of the Keto Paleo Life, a video interview series where Vivica talks about innovative health and diet practices with some of the industry's most influential thought leaders. She's known for being the first holistic nutritionist who successfully utilized a ketogenic approach as the foundation to endocrine rebalancing. Vivica uses a therapeutic and holistic approach to food, lifestyle, and supplementation that utilizes the healing power of foods and mindset to address the incapacitating symptoms of many lifestyle diseases that have plagued our modern lives. Check out her website at thenourishedcavemen.com. And before we jump into today's show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this to make sure you never miss an episode. Hey, Vivica, excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. This is great. Yeah, awesome. So I find that most people that uh, have come to do this work really have their own story um, as to how they came here. So you could share with us your your, your journey with us. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think that mm, for most people, it's like having to experience things on their own skin is a big motivator to learn, right? My story started with like having to resolve a number of different health challenges for myself. Um, Something that I always tell everybody they should know about me is that I'm doctor phobic and hospital phobic. Mm. So I have natural distrust of conventional, you know, Western medicine. I grew up luckily with acupuncturists and homeopath and chiropractor. And so as I got older, I never really trusted medical doctors. So when health issues came about for me, I had to go and resolve them on my own mostly. And this is the kind of thinking that eventually led me to the path of nutrition and to study so that I could uh, figure things out better for myself. So I started out with gallbladder disease Hmm. and then I had prediabetes fibroids, Hashimoto's, hypothyroidism, Mm. and then perimenopause. And I was able to resolve all of those things with true nutrition, diet, and supplementation and lifestyle very successfully. And the last thing that I'm dealing with, I think it's more of like a lifetime quest here is anxiety and panic attacks. And I know that is not, this is where I have to move beyond the physiological and getting more into, you know, early childhood trauma and such things. But um, I feel like I'm finally onto something to resolve it because I never wanted to go the medical way. So I've never been on medication, but it's been a lifelong issue for me. And I know it's also hormonal related. And now with entering menopause, it's, you know, it definitely doesn't help. (laughs) Absolutely. And we see that time and time again, we've done episodes on this on the podcast with functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner that I work with, uh, Brandy. So she, she struggled with anxiety for years and then later found out she had celiac disease and, and still is, you know, making, making changes to diet and lifestyle to, to, to help with that. And a lot of people we work with it with uh, infertility have been on anti-anxiety medication. And then as we make these changes to their diet, panic attacks and anxiety seem to lessen and then yes digging into using emotional freedom technique and hypnotherapy and those sort of other different different modalities because sometimes the the diet piece can get you to a good place but then there's still other things to say the emotional traumas and to deal with that 
Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, nevertheless, that gave me a really good foundation because I feel like, you know, I got an excellent foundation on how to handle the different ph physiological aspects of healing. So it's great because, you know, it really helps me work with my clients and be successful in my work with my clients. Absolutely. Love that. So um, let's talk about the therapeutic uh, ketogenic diet. Obviously, like right now, keto is, is all the rage. I think, in the, uh, I think when I was doing a bunch of calls back in February, I, I, every single person I talked to on the phone, I started keto, I started keto. So it's, it's, it's you know, all the rage right now. But um, so how is therapeutic ketogenic diet different than, than just the keto diet? Where is it? So a therapeutic version of the ketogenic diet is basically a way of eating that's designed for healing. And it is based on keto macros. And also for me, keto adaptation is a really big part of it. But it's a diet that is not like written in stone, but it's evolving. It's constantly evolving and it's evolving for the person who's doing the diet. So it's more of what I would call a lifestyle than a diet in itself. But it, I base um, the beginning for me, it's always starts with keto adaptation. So the, that's the, thera the ketogenic part. And then the therapeutic part is my ability to adapt that to the individual needs and also really basing it in what you eat and using nutrient-dense foods and processed, fresh, organic, mostly cooked at home, staying away from, you know, a lot of processed and packaged things. And also for me, it means no dairy because, uh, you know, I specialize in rebalancing hormones in, mm. within my keto practice and the dairy over and over seems to be something that just does not fit in the parameters that I want for healing. Yeah, that's a huge one because I interviewed, um, yeah, and Maria Emmerich. Oh, Maria Emmerich. Yeah, and so and so she had a dairy-free keto because I think a lot of times with keto, people are like, "Woo, I'm going to eat all this cheese and a lot of dairy." And yeah, we we look at doing an elimination diet, take out the top allergens for ten days, and then systematically bring them back in, see how food impacts you. And a lot of people we find um, dairy is, I think, yeah, I saw something on your website, sixty percent. I've seen as high as seventy percent of people are actually um, intolerant to dairy. So. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, so you're taking a different spin on this. Yeah, and it's not even about intolerance. For me, it goes beyond that because um, about the dairy, like, yes, it's pretty evident if you're intolerant, then you want to eliminate it. But what about people that are not having direct symptoms to the consumption of, of dairy? There is something bigger. There is more going on in there than just like the food intolerance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that underlying inflammation that maybe sometimes people are like, oh, I brought back in dairy and I didn't notice anything. Well, mm -hmm. especially in this case, if you're trying to get pregnant, that there's there's a sign of something else is, is off. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. And so the, the therapeutic ketogenic diet, anything else you'd like to share on that? It's just like really eating to feed your body, body to nourish your body and to get the biggest advantage that we can get from a diet, from a way of eating. So for me, it has an evolutionary, makes evolutionary sense. I am, you know, big on human evolution and how we evolved through different ways of eating to the point where we are now. And also, again, is always to get the optimal out of what we can get from our diet and lifestyle so that we can feel the best. And, you know, I use it in my practice with patients. So I know that I would never be able to get the results that I get with my clients if I didn't use the diet as the foundation from their health, for their health, you know. So we start with the diet as the foundation and then we do all the other, you know, nutrition practices, supplementation and detoxification. But the diet is definitely the, the platform that we rely on for all the, the improvements and the changes. Absolutely. And for some reason, people think, you know, what you place on your fork doesn't matter and come to the diet piece last, like the absolute last place, which, yeah, where I'm, I'm with you, we look at it first. And I guess mm -hmm. if, it, and if it's too scary to look at it first, then we would look at mindset changes to help. Like we, we, we run a, a mindfulness fertility series. So helping with mindfulness because um, it could be, especially with infertility, going through so much heartbreak and, and, and stress and um, like triggers wherever you go. 
And then we're going to say, hey, let's change your diet. It could be too much. So potentially that could be the gateway. But yeah, we always start with diet too. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And so what exactly is ketosis? So ketosis is a metabolic state. So we are used to um, come from the glucose uh, sugar burning state, like so that we are taught in school that glucose is necessary for life and we burn sugar for energy. So we need to consume carbohydrates because that's what we need to survive. Well, that is incorrect. And we actually have this like really cool secret almost program like that lays dormant in our body. And it's like an evolutionary program that has developed through our evolution to prevent humans from just dropping dead of starvation in within two days of not being able to consume sugar. So what happens is that when we restrict carbohydrates, uh, meaning something you would do like back in the hunter gatherer days, especially in winter where there was no vegetation, no fruits, no supermarket, <laughs> you know, to sell you your veggies and all the ho- only food that we would have had access to were like preserved meats or fat or animal products. So basically zero carbohydrates. <clears throat> what happens is that our body does not store carbohydrates for more than like what's enough for two days of survival. So what would happen after those two days if we didn't have a plan B, we'll just drop dead, you know? And so our body has the ability to shift. And once the carbs are not coming in, then all the sugar runs out and your body's shifts automatically and starts producing what are called ketones in your liver. Um, And the ketones are metabolites. They're very similar to glucose in in, um, the shape of the molecule. And so they're specifically designed for our brains. Um, The main ketone is beta-hydroxybutyrate, butyric acid, and that is the one that can get used by our brains to Um, serve as an energy source. So when in school they tell you that your brain can only use sugar for energy, that is not correct because our brains can adapt to use up to 75% ketones. So when we restrict carbohydrates through the diet, this is when we can cause um, this state of nutritional ketosis and the body starts using fats for fuel ketones first and then the adaptation continues so we start being able to burn um, the ketones and then we can burn free fatty acids and there are a number of adaptation that happen in the body but we optimize our ability to burn fat for energy basically and so with the intermittent fasting um and so is this recommended for women that are trying to conceive are there any issues with that we talk a little bit about intermittent fasting uh-huh. Well, um, for me, intermittent fasting, like intermittent fasting is bundled up with keto a lot of times. <clears throat> and for me, they're not necessarily two things that need to be bundled together because there is the ketogenic diet and ketosis and keto adaptation. It's one thing. And then intermittent fasting kind of comes natural when you're keto adapted because you are not hungry um, for long periods of time, your glucose is very stable, so you don't have those blood sugars up and down that make you like crave carbs or crave food in general. You're never going to be like starving, ravenous, hangry, all those things. So it comes easier to like maybe skip a meal and go a long period of time without eating. So that's what intermittent fasting is. And it's been used to kind of leverage the benefits of ketosis as well, because when you're fasting, you get into higher ketosis. And also if you skip a meal, you can go lower calorie kind of, you know, easier. So there are benefits to intermittent fasting, but when we look at it from the hormonal perspective and the fertility perspective, then um, me as, you know, a functional, I'm not a functional medicine doctor, I'm just a nutritionist, but I do functional and endocrinology. And so from that perspective, I can see that all the hormones are connected. And when we fast for a long period of times, if our adrenals are not super solid and like really healthy, strong pathway, it will become a stressor. 
And it is a stressor on the body, but we can have positive stressors and negative stressors. And the stressors will become negative when our body is just not able to handle them successfully. So intermittent fasting as you are trying to become super fertile and nourish your body for conceiving, for me, is counterintuitive because it's a stressor. And if we want a good hormonal balance to have the best possible ovulation and, you know, <clears throat> most predictable period and all the phases of the period working good, then we should try to eliminate any hormonal stressors. Therefore, no intermittent fasting. And for me, the focus should really be on nourishing your body and just, you know, adding all the different elements that will give you stable hormones and a fully nourished body so that when you do conceive, then you'll be able to produce a very healthy pregnancy. And what about if there's issues around um, insulin resistance or blood sugar di uh, dysregulations or anything, or PCOS? What do you recommend in there? Um, you know. there's probably I would you know I in the ideal world what I would do is to get a patient to resolve those issues before she tries to get pregnant mm -hmm. because you know I always try I have had you know many fertility patients and I know that that's just the ideal solution it doesn't always work in reality but at least to have a three-month period where a woman can work on her own personal health before she tries to conceive. Because in three months, a lot of things can happen. And, you know, in three months, we can make a lot of progress towards rebalancing the hormones and towards, like, you know, um, dealing with PCOS, clean, cleansing the body, and also rewriting the DNA which is for me one of the most important parts of like, why do we prep for fertility? It's because we want to give, you know, our baby, our progeny, the best possible chances to be a healthy individual. And if we do the right prep for like a, a minimum of three months, then every single cell in the DNA can be re, you know, um, rewritten. And so we get the best options to transmit a healthy DNA to our children. Yeah, epigenetics, it, it matters. It's, right. it's hard, especially when you've been on the journey for so many years, and then we're saying, you know, let's take a, that's not a break, but it's it's a, a pause to, to look at this. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there's a lot of pressure, especially if someone is, is a lot, it doesn't matter really to me how, how old someone is, because everyone that comes, that, that's dealing with infertility, they're, they're past the the time when they want to have their baby. So there's mm -hmm. always this increased pressure and then saying, hey, let's take three to six months to focus on this. It's really going to impact your, your preconception health, your, you know, your postpartum, your baby's health. Um, it can seem like a lot, but actually, again, it's a short, short window in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I agree. If you look at the big picture, three months is really not going to make such a big difference when what could make a big difference is in the positive impact. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And then as far as issues with keto for fertility, so you talked about the fasting, which you wouldn't recommend. Um, what else do you kind of see that maybe people could get wrong? Uh, one thing is that they do extreme calorie restriction. So the calories are too low for too long. And I think that that's probably one of the main issues with fertility. It's not even about the carbs. It's about um, how bad you restrict the calories. So if you're trying to conceive, I think that it would be a very good idea to have a period where you're not restricting your calories at all. And you could still do... Um, a ketogenic diet, but maybe it will look more like a cyclical ketogenic diet where there is periods of time like where you are very strict and keto and then maybe like, you know, a few days a week, there can be like added carbs added, um, carbs added on to that day so that you can have a balance of both the benefits of keto you know, the restricted diet of keto so that you're eliminating a, bunch, and a lot of like inflammatory foods or food sensitivities, but we're not restricting the calories. So the body, you know, is not 
being impacted by a stressor, like we talked about stressors before in any way. <clears throat> and we can also still recirculate, circulate some carbs, but in a way that does not impact our blood sugar. So we're not going to be high carb all the time, but only strategic places, you know, and, and points where we're going to add in carbs so that we can take the advantage of the carbs without having the downside. So another thing we can do with the ketogenic diet is that we can modify it um, throughout the cycle. So different days of the cycle of, of the, you know, the menstrual cycle have actually different needs. So what I would do is like, you know, start with like day one of the period and having more protein, higher protein during the part of your period. And then the first week when you finish from the finish of your period until right before ovulation, this is usually a time where a woman can be very low carb and high fat and just harness all the benefits of that and have good energy and just, you know, support your hormonal balance. And then as we enter ovulation, we can start bringing in more carbs. But again, it would be in a targeted way. So you would just like add in the carbs at night and start like gradually increasing during the day, like, you know, staying strictly keto, but then at night increasing your carb amount, maybe have some fruit carb ups or some sweet potato carb ups. And then right before the beginning of the cycle, the last week, it would be increasing the carbs even further because that would just support the natural cravings but also nourish the body better. So that's when the carb ups could be done with more veggies, um, more greens, and, you know, again, like root starches like sweet potatoes and yams. Um, and what I see that's very beneficial, and I'm sure you talk about that a lot um, in your practice with your clients, is the seed rotation that can be added to all of these practices. Yeah, we did a, we did an episode on sea cycling. Mm -hmm. like yeah, that. I really like it. It works good with keto because, you know, that's within keto foods. So mm -hmm. people that are doing keto, they can also do the seed rotation and not fall off their, their program. Mm -hmm. And I guess with being, you know, the, 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 the keto craze, it was the paleo craze, now it's the keto craze. There's a lot of processed foods. And I think people... Maybe you get, get sucked into that, but what do you see there? I think, see that is a trap and it's an easy trap to fall into because, you know, we are looking for convenience. We're all looking for shortcuts, but keto can be done in a very simple and easy way without having to resort to processed foods, you know, and I think that maybe as women, younger women, you know, they will not feel the effects of this kind of way of eating but as you get older and I'm 50 right now so I've been through it myself even though I was never a big fan of processed foods but I definitely had to do some cleanup on my own diet you know even if I always ate relatively well compared to a lot of people in America and I'm also Italian, Italian so that helps <laughs> but yeah I think that trying to do keto that a lot of people call it like lazy keto they're not it's not just about calculating macros but for me lazy keto is just when you eat whatever i call it also mcdonald's keto and if you're just trying to shortcut to a goal like weight loss that might work but i definitely don't think it's worth the long-term consequences of shortcutting your own health you mm -hmm. know yeah, it's not, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And then do you have a, if, do you recommend any bars if someone wants to have a keto bar? Like, is that something you even go to? You know, I, I do recommend, um, perfect keto has some pretty good bars they come out with. And sometimes I recommend them, but for me, that is an entry level product. Yeah. So for people that are brand new to keto and they come from a world of processed foods and convenience foods and they were eating maybe candy bars before and they need a stepping stone to like get better and better. So that can be a good stepping stone. But once you evolve your way of eating to where you're able to like navigate better choices, then I think that um, the bars are not even needed anymore. And like, I use different kinds of snacks that are mostly unprocessed or minimally processed whenever possible. 
Absolutely. I know I was in Costco the other day, I, like, literally two huge rows of bars and Costco is coming out with their, their own keto bars. And it was like, Holy right. cow, was like, oh, yeah. money, money, money. Um, I know. Everybody's <laughs> jumping on the bandwagon. Exactly. And then as far as the, the poor quality fats with keto, sometimes Oof. people are maybe choosing the wrong ones there. Yeah, fats are really important, especially when your diet is like 60%, 70% fat. I, you know, I have a video that I did, I think four years ago or more, when I first started keto it was one of my first videos in, on YouTube. And it's about quality fats for keto. Mm -hmm. Because from the very beginning, I saw how easily people could get misled. And you know, just think like, oh, I can use any kind of fat. So I could be using canola oil and get my fat from that. And not just that, Sarah, when um, four years ago, I went to a keto convention for epilepsy. Mm. So it was, you know, for um, untreatable seizures and babies with untreatable seizures where they use a ketogenic diet. And the kind of products that were sold at that convention made me literally like grow white hair because <laughs> they were all based in like absolutely terrible fat. There was canola oil, there was safflower seed, oh, yeah. like um, hydrogenated oil in baby formula. Like I was like, are you kidding me? Mm. This is what keto is? Like no way. So that's what got me really motivated to speak about the quality of fat. These days, what I recommend is like mostly animal fats more than even like everybody's like coconut oil, coconut oil all day long. But if you think about it, coconuts don't grow here. Most of the United States, we have to import them from other countries. And, you know, it's not just about the sustainability. It's just we're not really evolved eating that much coconut oil, even though it could be a good fat. It's still a vegetable oil. And me personally, I think that the best oils for cooking are animal fats. So beef, tallow, or lard, or, you know, other animal fats like chicken fat, schmaltz, you can make it yourself and it can be really delicious. So I think that um, it's better to use animal fats and then you can use butter and ghee, but I prefer ghee if somebody is even a little bit like intolerant to dairy. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of ghee and I really like it. It's one of my favorite cooking fats. Yeah, I haven't gotten into the animal fat cooking. Um, you're just buying that at your local... Uh, Health food store. Yeah. Or Amazon. You know, like a number of companies are actually coming out with different um, different fats. Let me see which one is the Epic from the Epic Bar. Oh, yeah. okay. They just sent me a sampler of their new cooking fats, and they're pretty good. Oh. Uh, what I do, you know, a lot is that I buy extra fat ground beef, which I use as my ground beef. Sometimes I have the butcher mix it with like a little bit of heart meat or, or liver so that I get the benefit of the organ meats and you don't really taste them. Because oh, I, I literally went and had liver. I'm like, oh, I got to have some organ meats. I had it and I forgot that I just cannot stand it. <laughs> That's interesting to mix it. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so when you hide it in your ground beef and then you season it, you really won't taste it. But the beef is so fatty, like, because I have them add, like, a bunch more fat and then ground it for me. Mm -hmm. So it always leaves a lot of drippings in the pan. And so I, I use those to cook my other stuff. And so I kind of, like, stack things. So where I cook the meat first and then I remove the meat and then I'll cook my veggies in the the fat that is left by the meat mm. and I personally don't eat pork but I used to eat pork and when I ate pork I always saved every little bit of bacon fat like scrupulously so that I can reuse it and then I would use that for cooking so back in the old days when my grandma used to save the fat she would like keep it in this little thing on her on her stove and I remember being just so disgusted by this little thing but like what, what do you where do you how do you keep it then and that little thing on the stove <laughs> like your grandma <laughs> back in the old days of grandma okay yeah well it makes sense right uh okay good. but so you don't like, keep it too long because i'm constantly using it yeah. so like i have like maybe a little jar of it and that jar like constantly gets filled and emptied because i'm using it all the time your grandma used extra i'll put it in the fridge okay you know, 
But grandma, grandma used to use the old Cam- Campbell's soup, soup tin can, so that would not be recommended. So you have a little glass yeah. container then? Yeah, I yeah. think glass <laughs> okay. would be better. <laughs> okay, yeah, so beef tallow, lard, chicken fat, um, mm. yeah, to add to add these in to, to your, your diet, which we recommend this as well, but I, I haven't, I'm still on the coconut oil side of things and avocado oil, but yeah, mm-hmm. definitely giving you giving some, and then Epic, so I, I, I'll check that out, that's, that's awesome. Um, Okay, and what about some too many sugar alternatives with keto? Yeah, I've done really, see, that's, again, it's like the keto bars. That's a stepping stone. Because when you come from a a sad diet, Mm -hmm. and there is a lot of sugar in everything, especially a lot of processed foods contain sugar, it's really hard to just wean yourself off sugar from one day to the other. So switching to keto and using all the sweeteners and the like fake keto recipes, meaning like, you know, you have your noodle, keto noodle recipes and keto cuckoo cookies recipes and keto pizza recipes. So that's a great transition. And so I think that the sweeteners really belong in that transition place. But then once you refine again, and that's why a lot I talk about the evolution of keto for long term, because I don't think that sugar alcohols are very healthy for the body in general. Mm-hmm. So I think that naturally evolving out of consuming them so much is a good place to be. And again, you know, we can always have a keto treat or a fat bomb or a keto dessert. You know, there is, of course, a place and time for that. But here we're kind of infringing a little bit into the territory of emotions where, Mm -hmm. you know, as women, we tend to emotional eat a lot. And then is it keto emotional eating better than just sad diet emotional eating? Yes, for sure. Um, It's, you know, at least you're going to use better products and it's with better results. But then there is a point where I think we really need to look at those patterns and like, go to the bottom of like that emotional eating is it hormonal is it trauma related is it you know something that's going on in your life so why are we doing that and you know address that point exactly instead of stuffing it down with food um and what's your take on swerve because that seems to be a big key like i literally went to my health food store i'm like oh here's big big bags of very expensive swerve mm-hmm Swerve is erythritol, is a sugar alcohol. It's mm-hmm. the one that, like, I did a video on that too, by the way. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Your listeners are interested in seeing the details. It's on okay. my YouTube channel, um, Vivica Menegas' YouTube channel. But um, so I, at the beginning of keto, I did kind of like an in-house uh, study with my clients where I had them test their blood sugar and their reaction and their gut reactions with a number of different uh, sweeteners. And erythritol was the one that tested the best. Back in the days, xylitol was still really big. Now it's barely used anymore because now there is monk fruit that is mixed with erythritol and that seems to be much better for everyone. But when uh, of all the different things we tested, erythritol was the best one for both blood sugar spiking and gut reactions. So having an impact on your digestion, digestive system. Um, I still don't think it's the best thing to use, especially in large quantities, but a tablespoon here and there won't kill you. It's just use common sense, right? (laughs) Yeah, if you go into the big bag of it, making all your treats with Swerve, um, yeah, maybe that. I, I I don't personally like any of those kind of sweeteners. I I, I like a I do maple syrup or, or a little bit of honey. But um, but I guess if you if you've got a blood sugar issue or insulin resistance, then you, you potentially some of those potentially swerve could be recommended. Then is what you're saying? Yeah, and if you're doing keto, it might kick you out of ketosis. If you're trying to keto adapt, it might not be the right time. It depends where you are. Like for example, I've been keto for like five years. But my keto now looks very different at the beginning, you know. So right now, if I want to do a tablespoon of honey in some of my things, I will do that. And it's not going to really affect where I'm at in my journey. But when you're first starting, it's, I think it's better to concentrate your effort at the beginning in, so you can properly keto adapt. Mm-hmm. And then if you really, you know, I would recommend more like 
a couple of drops of stevia if you want to have a sweetener, you know. Mm-hmm. And and if you do use the retrotol, just cut down like a lot of the keto recipes out there. They just use tons of the sugar, tons and tons and tons. And you don't need to use so much and like start retraining the taste buds to actually taste things and not just be flattened out by the sugar. Absolutely. That's what I've, stevia for me personally, it has this horrible aftertaste taste. I yeah. just don't like it. I don't mean either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I prefer not to put any sweetener yeah, exactly. in myself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, so we talked about dairy, but is there anything else you'd like to dig into with dairy and fertility and keto? Anything we've, we've missed? Well, for me, like dairy is being called like an endocrine signaling system. Like the milk in the dairy is like, it has its own signaling system for the endocrine system. Um, for your own endocrine system. So they are stimulating to certain hormonally driven pathways. And this has been, um, it came out in research regarding mostly cancer and the possibility of stimulating cancer growth from the dairy. Um, Lauren Cordain, which was one of the original uh, paleo people that did the most research and like started the paleo movement, has research on that. Um, But for me, what I saw in clinical practice that this is true beyond the cancer growth. It's actually very true when it comes to women hormones and imbalance in women hormones. It also really affects our ability to lose weight. Um, And I've seen it with many case studies of like many clients came to me and were doing keto already. And like, not like having different issues, different cases, a lot of them hormonal, did not want to let go of the dairy. And after, you know, some convincing, when they went dairy free, the results were like evident and immediate. So, you know, sometimes we find the research to support what we see in clinical practice. Sometimes we don't. But for me, like real life, real people and real experiences is always what counts you know i see it with one woman after the other the moment they let go of the dairy they start feeling better they lose weight and then slowly the hormones get back online yeah absolutely and if if if, and many people over and over again say to me but i can't give up the cheese yeah That's probably what's causing the problem it's like the thing that you're like no i can never give it up absolutely you yeah up, you know, your health is re- your health will be restored Mm-hmm. And it, it might take a little more than just the dairy, depending right. on how severe your case is. Mm-hmm. But it is a big indicator when you're like really attached to a food or really addicted to a food, most likely you're sensitive to that food and yes. that food is not helping you. So we say, if what, what do you have for breakfast? So if, if the thing you have to have for breakfast, is it the yogurt every day? Is it the two pieces of toast with peanut butter? That could be what you're intolerant to, kind of your, your go-to thing in the breakfast. I heard that a little while ago. I thought that was kind of interesting because I used to have all sorts of yogurt all the time. Yeah, I have a dairy intolerance. <laughs> yeah. So male factor infertility, how can keto help there? For men, once they have determined, first of all, they should get checked and determined that they don't have physiological blockages or physiological issues that are, you know, really the thing, um, the thing that's happening. But otherwise, once that is passed, if it comes to just like getting the body to be healthier and the hormones to align, then for sure keto provides the raw material out of which the hormones are made, number one. Uh, so the, the sex hormones are made of cholesterol, so we need to have enough fat in our diet. And then I think another factor that's important is that the, through keto, we lower sugar consumption, so we lower insulin resistance. And because the sex hormones and insulin are very closely connected in both men and women, mm-hmm. it's another factor that is going to help us. It's supportive of the solution that we want to get. You know, sometimes it takes more than just one factor to get where we want to get. But like having such a diet that's really supportive of the physiological processes, it's make, it does make a difference. Mm-hmm. And then so digging into the adrenals, ovaries, thyroid, how, how can keto help with that? So 
Yeah, <laughs> Dream House Over is entire it is like the triad, the like you know the the main triad of the endocrine system, and they're very closely connected. So for me, there is and there are a number of ways that keto can help. The number one is it eliminates stressors especially like for the adrenals, it eliminates the blood sugar up and down. So, so that's a big stressor on the body. So that's a, a big thing towards adrenal support. You know, when we go keto and your blood sugar is stable, then that one stressor of blood sugar up and down is eliminated. Um, then again, it provides the raw material for all the hormones. So when, you know, we start ketos, a lot of people come from the old way of eating, which was low fat and years and years of yo-yo diets and low fat. So keto becomes really nourishing for the body and it can only be supportive to all the different adrenal pathways, I mean, hormonal pathways. Another good factor is that it detoxes the body from the food sensitivities because it is an elimination diet. Mm -hmm. So the cleaner we do keto, the better of an elimination detox diet it is. And um, then, for example, it eliminates things like gluten, which is big for um, the fact of like molecular mimicry, which is an issue for the thyroid, you know, so people who have hypothyroidism or could develop Hashimoto's, it's really important to eliminate molecules like proteins like gluten, which goes in and could be just a spark of an autoimmune attack on the thyroid. So again, at the end of the day, it's really about eliminating stressors and adding nutrition to your diet. Yeah, we recommend um, for anyone really trying to conceive, men and women, to go a minimum of dairy and gluten-free for three months. And really, if you're to fast track it, look at the elimination diet. We had Dr. Tom O'Brien talking on talking about how gluten impacts both uh, male and female fertility, and also uh, Dr. Sarah Valentine talking about um, um, Hashimoto's and uh, uh, hypothyroidism and looking at the AIP diet as well so mm -hmm. uh, definitely gluten is a, a top one and I think people kind of get that a little bit wrong where they go gluten light which doesn't work so mm -hmm. I go 100% yeah on that. gluten is like a switch it's either on or off yeah, exactly especially at the beginning you might be become tolerant of some gluten at some point but first you got to clean up and it takes a minimum of three months to get all the gluten out of your system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's really important. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, what about blood sugar? Do you look at a, a, a glucometer or like what, how do you, or is it looking more at a food diary? Both. Uh, I do glucose readings and flu food diary and symptom diary. Okay. So I try to do some really extensive journaling for the beginning of the phase, beginning phase of my work with my clients, because for me, it's a really big tool in managing and addressing their lifestyles and finding those places where we need to make modifications. Sometimes it's really subtle little things, but they're important. And it also, I find it really helps a person to connect the dots when they see it all on one page and you see in your blood sugars, you see your foods, you see your symptoms, and then suddenly it just clicks. So it's a, it's a great tool. Yeah, I think people think of a food diary saying they're just logging their food. This is actually putting your symptoms. So how did you feel after the meal? You, you know, your, your mental, physical mm -hmm. well-being and, and, mar and marking that down. Do you, have a, yes. do you have an app at all you can recommend for that? Do you use anything? Or? You know, and the apps have changed a lot in the time that since I've been starting keto. I am still on my fitness pal. Mm -hmm. Uh, for that, because it has some advantages for me as a practitioner that I can log in and look at my client's diaries and I can look at their notes. So they, they can put everything that I need in one page. But when we first begin, before we transition to macros, I have my own um, my own spreadsheet that I send them so that it has a certain format that really works for me. Mm -hmm. And so we use that and then eventually transition into tracking macros. And then we use my fitness pal. I know that there is carb manager is a really nice app. I like that one a lot. And chronometer is also a really good app. But for me, from my point of view, I can look at their diaries 
So I, you know, they have to give me their account. And so it's really inconvenient because that's what I need to do is to be able to see all their entries. Mm -hmm. So my fitness pal lets me do that. It's good for each, each for the practitioner and for the client. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so you've got a number of, of cookbooks here. Um, so let's talk about some, um, some foods that you can recommend for maybe a, a, a day in the life of some meals for keto, including some snacks, anything you like? Well, my, I recommend a pretty simple way of eating for every day. Like I know there are tons and tons of keto cookbooks that came out, including my own. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I wanted to have my own cookbook is because I don't agree with a lot of ingredients that are used in keto. And because, you know, I already mentioned I do keto for healing. I was very specific of how you do keto for healing, how you do keto for nourishing your body. So I, of course, recommend to try to eat at home or home-cooked meals as much as possible, a little bit of prepping. The meals don't have to be complicated. What, like, my typical keto day for me or my, one of my clients would look like is, like, breakfast. I love to give them fat tea, so I, I don't recommend caffeine in a phase of healing. So I use decaffeinated teas, but still can be mixed with fat and with collagen and, you know, different things that you can put in there to make it really like nourishing and healing. And then some sort of like, eggs and like the MCT oil then, or you're doing the... Um, I really don't like MCT oil. No. <laughs> yeah. no, I very rarely use it. I think it's more appropriate for performance, mm -hmm. like for athletes and people who do keto for a specific performance for energy. Most keto the people that come to me, they're actually needing to lose weight. So instead of adding a bunch of fat to the diet, we try to use the minimum indispensable fat, but also a lot of your own body fat, you know. So trying to add fat to everything does not necessarily make, you know, keto. Keto is more about restricting the carbs. It's not just about adding the fat. So is there a collagen protein that you like? Um, what is that called? Um, vital proteins, I think. Yeah, vital proteins. And, yeah. and, so, and what, what oil then are you using in the tea? I use ghee in my tea. Oh, and, oh really? Oh, yeah. That's my oh. favorite. And for people like sometimes ghee and coconut oil, or they can use coconut oil in the tea if they don't like the flavor of ghee. And sometimes I use butter. I am not super sensitive to dairy, so butter is fine for me. It depends, you know, like when my hormones are kind of acting out a little bit, then I go to ghee and I <laughs> avoid all dairy. And when I feel better, I know that I have a little bit of a margin that I can use butter. <laughs> yeah. So decaf tea, or could you do, a, well, you don't want to do a herbal tea with this because then with that, with the butter. Oh, yeah. You can use um, dandelion, roasted dandelion root is great. Yeah. Okay. Um, chicory is a little more carby, but it's still okay. And then um, rooibos is really good as oh, well. Yeah. Okay, and so you do like a scoop of collagen, a, a, what, a teaspoon of ghee, or how much ghee would you put in there? Tablespoon of ghee. Tablespoon of ghee, and then... And then sometimes I add almond butter in there if I wanted to have like a more hearty breakfast. Because for me at this point, I will just have the fat tea for breakfast, so I want to make sure there is enough fat and enough protein in there. And and do and you whip that, or are you just... Oh, yeah, blend it. Put yeah. it in the blender. Okay. That's where the magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> magic Vitamix. Um, yeah. Okay. So tea. Great. And, and, and that's your breakfast. So that's all you have for breakfast? Um, that's for me. For my client, especially at the beginning of keto, I have them eat meat and eggs for breakfast. Okay. Yeah. And unless we're detoxing, so the during the detox, we're doing no eggs for a few weeks. But mm -hmm. otherwise, I think eggs are a great way to have like an easy and nutritious breakfast. If people are sensitive to eggs, they can try duck eggs or quail eggs, mm -hmm. and those usually work. Um, goose eggs are great, too, if you have access to those. But duck eggs are pretty easily found. So if somebody is sensitive to eggs, chicken eggs mostly, they can try pastured eggs. A lot of times you're sensitive to what the chicken ate more than the egg itself. So if you try a better quality egg, then sometimes you're not sensitive. And also the whites too, they can be sensitive to the whites more than the yolk. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's, 
in mm-hmm. my practice, I saw it 50-50. I actually saw some people being sensitive to yolk and some to white. So both and, can happen. And what kind of meat are you recommending? I am a big fan of beef. That's my favorite. And lamb. But any kind of meat. Like I prefer red meat early in the day because it really anchors down your energy and your blood sugar. And it also seems to do better as far as like mental clarity and, you know, grounding you into your body. Yeah. Anything else with that? Then so the beef or lamb and, and eggs? Sometimes I would put like fermented veggies like sauerkraut or, you know, fermented beets, fermented carrots, just a little tablespoon of that. It really depends on the person and like how their gut works, but... For me, that works really good. I try to have fermented veggies at least twice a day. So if it's not in the morning, then it'll be for lunch and dinner for sure. But a lot of times my breakfast will be like a meat patty with a half an avocado and um, a, a blob of sauerkraut in there. And if people look at my Instagram, you know, that's where I put all my meals or a lot of my meals I go on Instagram. So like, it's sometimes it's always the same things because I've done keto for so long, yeah. you know, and usually I'm so busy and I think your listeners can probably sympathize with the busy part. Mm-hmm. So I don't have a lot of time to make breakfast. I can make pancakes or, you know, keto pancakes or whatever. Um, maybe on the weekend once in a while I treat myself and will make keto pancakes, but mostly it's just like the meat, the eggs, the veggie that's it <laughs> and the tea yeah and i guess if there's a histamine or a candida thing going on you because i don't normally do the i can't do the fermented fermented veggies so if you have a histamine thing but mm-hmm. um meat lamb eggs avocado is great like say, yeah that. and it really depends i think that people only will develop histamine sensitivity when they do a lot of preserved meats and you know especially cheeses and preserved meats more than the the fermented veggies i never had an histamine issue when somebody ate just a little bit of fermented veggies and no cheese and no preserved meats okay um and then and then what about what does lunch look like lunch is like i you know it depends on the time of the year because in summer, I really like to have a big salad and I'll add like avocado and olives and maybe sardines or, you know, salmon on top of my salad and like make it a little bit like a lighter, like, you know, start adding some carbs in there because the morning I prefer to have more fat and protein. And then lunch would be like still fat and protein and a little bit of carbs. And if it's winter, maybe like I make a soup and have a soup like ready and then I have a bowl of soup and you know the soup will have um, usually some sort of like bone broth with pieces in there and maybe a little bit of veggies I'm not a huge fan of veggies in my soup but or I'll have some cooked veggies with it Um, and then at dinner is kind of the same but that's where I will have most of my carbs is at dinner Mm -hmm. And have, if I want to have more starchy carbs, like if I'm doing a carb up, which I recommend for people who, you know, for fertility is you might want to do like even like two, three, four times a week carb ups. And then dinner is the best time to do it. And you can have like a sweet potato or yam or, you know, broccoli or Brussels sprouts or cauliflower and, you know more veggies, cooked veggies, and then I always have a side of protein. So in my diet, I always anchor down to animal protein because I I feel that that is the most beneficial thing for everything, nutrition, blood sugar, and the health of the body. Mm -hmm. I'm getting hungry. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's almost time for dinner. Uh, Oh, sounds great. Okay, so the tea and then beef and lamb for breakfast and then some a lunch, a salad, and um, sardines, salmon, that sounds good. And then dinner, some sort of meat. And then looking at, for fertility especially, uh, two to four times a week, some sort of carb up. So you talked about sweet potatoes, um, cauliflower, broccoli, sort of the, some, some carbs. And for snacks? Um, yeah, snacks. Yeah, snacks. I usually would say have a fat bomb for snack. Okay. 
I have my second book that I published was, it's a fat bomb book. There are more than 200 recipes. I'm like, if you can think about a fat bomb, it's in there. (laughs) It's like coming up with 200 recipes for fat bomb to some imagination, but there are are sweet and they're dairy free and some have dairy as well. So there are options for everybody. And are there ones without nuts? Oh yeah. Yeah. What's an option without without nuts then a fat bomb? I'm, I really like, I have a few savory fat bombs where I mix like boiled eggs with um, a fat of choice. It can be coconut oil or butter or ghee. And then um, something like capers or just curry or olives, chopped olives. And then you put them in the blender and then you make these little balls. Oh. And put them on a little like silicone cup or a little paper cup, kind of like a candy but they're savory and they they make great mini meals or you can stuff avocados and bake them. I love to bake an egg inside an avocado. Mm -hmm. I have like seven different versions of that. Some are with cheese, some are without it. The publisher wanted dairy, so I had to do dairy (laughs) for that book. Oh, that sounds good. And what about a sweet one for people? Uh, Panna cotta. That was like my favorite. It still is my favorite dessert in the world. I'm Italian, you know, and panna cotta is like cream and gelatin, basically, and vanilla. Very simple, but it can be so exquisite. And I still think that after making 5 million versions of like keto panna cotta, I still have not got it to the point where like Italian panna cotta is, but I have like 10 different flavors of panna cotta, savory and sweet. <laughs> oh. And what would, be a, what would be a keto one? Because like, I'm envisioning the dairy one with all the sugar and everything. So what's a keto panna cotta? Well, you can just use a little bit of sweetener, but a little sweetener goes a long way. And you can do a cream panna cotta with dairy cream, or you can use coconut cream. Um, what else did I use for it? Almond milk and like add in like some sort of fat, extra fat. So there are a lot of little tricks you can do, but they're not hard at all. And then you just blend it. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, you you soften the gelatin. What you can do, you just warm it up with gelatin, like a tablespoon of gelatin and whatever, a cup of the liquid, the cream, and then you can put your flavor, you let it all warm up, then you put it in the blender, and then you put it in the mold and it's done. And once it's cold, it's ready. Oh, that sounds good. Mm. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, I need. I know. I, somehow you get stuck in this horrible recipe rut of just, you know, making the same thing over and over again. And it's like, okay, you need to have some. You, know, you gotta mix it up once in a while. So these these sound great. I'm excited. Um, yeah, and they make great mini meals because, yeah. like, some of the I have prosciutto cups. You know, like the Italian prosciutto, mm-hmm. the raham, and you oh, can yeah. bake those into little cups that you can pre-make, and then you can either stuff them later or you have these little cups and just bake them with the ingredients inside, like with eggs or with cheese or, you know, different things. And then do you have those like little quiches almost, but they are a prosciutto rind, um, like crust. And then inside is all the melted yumminess. And those are so good. <laughs> yeah. And you just use the little silicone cups then? Do you, do you where do you, I guess, yeah, Amazon or something like that? you can use those or just the, the muffin tins. Those okay, were yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Awesome. Okay. So, um, and so we'll link, it's actually, what's the name of your, your uh, new book? I don't think I have that in your bio. So the latest one is called The Keto Paleo Kitchen mm-hmm. and it's on Amazon. And then the, the second one was the big book of fat bombs, which okay. is also on Amazon. Awesome. And um, so is there anything that you're obsessed with right now? Well, we'll do a link to your, your book, but anything you're obsessed with as far as a book, a website, an app, a documentary, anything you just are loving right now? Um, I think I was just thinking, it's like, what can I suggest that it would be really cool? But um, I think that a great great resource for hormones would be my mentor, Rhonda Nelson, has a website. It's called restorationhealth.net. And she has a lot of 60-second videos. And she's the hormone guru. Like, you know, I learned everything from her. She doesn't work with individual clients anymore. Now she just teaches to practitioners. Hmm. But she has taught me so much. And she has a lot of good information there, a lot of good videos. And a lot of the stuff that I talk about in, you know, with my clients in my videos, in my podcasts and everything, 
I learned from her. So I, <laughs> you know, I had to give her a shout out because amazing. she's an amazing, amazing practitioner and doctor. So that's Rhonda Nelson, uh, Restor- Restoration Health. RestorationHealth.net. Dot .net. Okay, great. And um, any success stories you'd like to, anything that pops out for you? I'm sure you got lots that you'd like to share. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I have a good fertility story. Mm-hmm. And so this was a patient in her early 30s, and we'll call her Mary. But she already had two children, and then she had developed diabetes, diabetes 2. So she had extremely high insulin resistance and had been trying to conceive for a couple of years and could not. So when she came to me for fertility, because she wanted to have her third baby, but she also, I found out that she was toxic with heavy metals and then her insulin was really bad. So she had, um, her blood sugars were consistently high, but it was not even the blood sugar. It was really her insulin resistance at the receptor level. So we work together. My program that I work with most people is three months, three to four months. And so we went through the program and I made her promise me, like I do to all my clients, that they're not going to, they're going to try to not conceive, meaning have a protection while they're on the program, especially during the detox. We don't want to make a baby while your toxins are flying everywhere, you know, but it was not even a week after we finished the program, she was already pregnant. Oh, geez. <laughs> so it was just like, right at the exit of the program and she had a beautiful baby girl and great easy delivery like she could barely make it to the hospital the baby was already out Mm. and um, really healthy pregnancy so that was one of my favorite success stories and I get to see the pictures of the babies growing up (laughs) you Uh, know that's that's wonderful and yeah I I had another patient a couple of years ago she couldn't even make it to the end of the program and she got pregnant (laughs) and so I was like now I make them promise me that they have to use contraception well at least until we are done with detoxification because again it's I think the three-month thing that we're talking about where you can completely redesign your DNA and in three months a lot can happen you know why wouldn't you want to have the best possible outcome and just invest a little bit of time? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, great. Well, thanks for sharing those. That's awesome. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. And then you've got a free download here for the listeners. So uh, what labs to ask your doctor about hormones and you can, they can get that at the nourished caveman, uh, caveman.com forward slash podcast. And what will they learn um, in that download? Well, there is a lot of confusion sometimes about what labs we need to look at what hormones. So I just wanted to list for the different things that we want, like thyroid, adrenals, or or sex hormones, what are the best labs to order and why. So people can go to their doctors with those and give them a list and say, I want those, or they can have a functional medicine doctor, or they can come to me if they need to have labs run and they don't have a practitioner and also i'm offering a discount on my lab report calls so that if somebody already has labs or needs to run labs they can get a consult with me at a discounted rate oh great do they have to um is there just mention this podcast or how would they no it's just by going through to that link that is a page for the podcast is the nourishcaveman.com forward slash podcast. And then they just click, there are, you know, big clear buttons, (laughs) get the download, get the consoles. Awesome. (laughs) Yeah. So definitely check out the nourishedcaveman.com forward slash podcast. And thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Vivica. It was so fun talking to you. I love, I love this topic and I love your passion for this and excited um, to, to look at your, um, at your cookbooks here and, and start eating. So that sounds good. Yay. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Get Pregnant Naturally. Seriously, it means the world to me that you're here. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can be notified of upcoming episodes. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you are a U.S. resident, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E, to 345-345. You'll be prompted to enter your email address, and you will receive our three-day free fertility diet challenge. 
The challenge includes delicious chef prepared recipes that are specifically designed to enhance your fertility. Download the recipes and try them this weekend. For U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E, to 345-345. For non-U.S. residents, go to www.fertilitydietfreebie.com to access your special gift. That is Fertility Diet Freebie, F-E-R-T-I-L-I-T-Y, Diet D-I-E-T, Freebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E.com to access the three-day free fertility diet challenge. And I love this quote by Dr. Mark Hyman. He's the medical director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine and the chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine. What you find at the end of your fork is more powerful than anything you'll find at the bottom of a pill bottle. Thanks again for listening. Until next time.